Eh, nuevamente vamos a, a seguir con esta sección de videojuegos donde tendremos distintos paneles durante todo el día, espacios durante cada hora, entonces es muy importante que sigan aquí conectados con nosotros en este auditorio número uno, en el piso, pabellón 3, piso 2. Listo, en este espacio tendremos un panel que tiene como nombre Working with AAA. Tendremos a distintas voces que nos acompañarán en este panel. Dentro de ese, este panel de Co-Develop en Outsourcing Best Practice, tenemos a Luis Villegas, Vicepresidente of Technology, Create and Service at Sony PlayStation. David Murat, Vicepresidente of Creative Arts PlayStation Studio. Carlos Bolchens, Director of Audio Technology of Sony PlayStation, Pablo Velázquez, Senior Di Dialogue Designer en PlayStation Studios, Rob Clark, Director Partners Outsourcing y como moderador para este espacio tenemos a Herba Rojas, cofundador de Efectos Studios. Entonces, nuevamente, bienvenidos a Colombia 4.0, un espacio organizado por Ministerio TIC y nuevamente, bienvenidos a cada uno de los espacios y en especial aquí a Biojuegos. Good. Um, first of all, thank you guys for being in, uh, in Colombia. This is uh, super important for the industry and to continue encouraging people to get into the industry. Uh, this panel is very special because uh, one of the biggest companies in the world to develop video games is actually Sony PlayStation. Um, and this panel, uh, the expectation is to share how Sony work with several studios around the world and how you learn from those advices to make sure someday you will be able to work with them. So the first question is, how Sony works uh, with internal external studios and coordinate that work around the world? Vamos a esperar cinco minutos que creo que hay Falta el traductor, entonces. Ok. So again, uh, how Sony work with internal and external, external studios? And what is the, you guys, the work you do internally uh, with all the services uh, PlayStation has? Well, I take them. So, hi, my name is Dave, Dave Morant. I head up the Creative Arts team, which is an in-source team within PlayStation Studios. Uh, we do music, sound, uh, visual arts, and creative work. So as an in-source team, we work with all of the studios within PlayStation Studios, which is about 20 different teams. And even though we are quite a large organization internally, we outsource a lot to many different teams. Um, so we work on a project-based system, so the, the team will come to us and ask us, you know, can we provide these services? Where we can provide them, we do. Uh, and we have a large internal team that does that work, but we also outsource a lot, and we outsource globally. Uh, I think one of the main tenants is we're always looking for the best teams to drive quality, because that's part of what our brand is, and what we believe and expect to get from our partners. We work, and I say partners, because we want to have a partnership when we work with teams. It's really important to us that we're not just there for the day, we're there for a long time to work with people and help them grow their business too. Um, part of that work means like a lot of synch synchronization with several studios, I mean, several time zones. What that means in terms of, of production and making sure all the studios are delivering the quality uh, and the expectations uh, you guys are waiting for, especially Carlo or? I, th I think it depends a lot. Different studios have different needs. 
right? So some studios have a specific work that need to be time zone aligned, and then you find partners that work on that time zone. There's also different types of, of work that could be done asynchronously, right? What we call like 24 seven development, where folks are always making progress towards a title in a specific area. So you can, you can set it up. So by the time you're finishing the work day, the next team on a different uh, region or a different time zone is picking up that work and moving it forward. And then you, you continue that, uh, that work 24 seven. But it, it also depends on the preferences of the studios. Some studios really like to work on the same time zone and they have core hours. So that puts restrictions on the partners. Other studios are completely fine uh, doing asynchronous work and they might be in Europe and working with Asia or, or, or the Americas and it, and it works fine. Sometimes they have a blended model where they do both, right? And it works very, very well for them. Like if you're doing uh, certain types of editing for cinematics or mocap, you have to be in the same region. But if you're creating assets, it's much, much easier. With that, I'll, I'll throw it to Rob. I think Rob has a lot of experience in this space. Like what have you seen work well and not work well? Yeah, so each team generally is gonna have somebody who's producing the work with the external partner. And their role is going to be looking ahead to see what work needs to be done, lining it up with the vendor, and uh, making sure that it is delivered on time, and that there are people ready to receive that content, check it, integrate it into the engine, and validate it, and make sure it's working properly. But it is a daily task of monitoring all the materials that are being delivered. One thing, I think one way to look at this problem is to actually look through an example. Paola has been working in this space for a long time. I'm curious, do you want to share like what your workflow looks like and when you work with partners? Uh, yes, um, so I am a dialogue designer at PlayStation and we work a lot with external uh, outsourcers and providers, um, not only in uh, the English dialogue. Um, as you know, many of our PlayStation titles, they we have a lot of dialogue, right? So we have, you know, thousands and thousands of dialogue lines and assets that we've had to deal with. Um, so it's not only a matter of coordinating this kind of work with our different uh, uh, outsourcers, but also um, treating it with, with the volume and keeping the quality level high, right? Um, so in terms of, uh, for example, if we're working on English, uh, a lot of the time we use English as the main source, uh, so it's sort of like the language that we're going to base off of uh, our uh, levels, for example. So we do that, um, have English as a source of uh, check for the different uh, languages that we um, localize for. Um, so we have specific tools as well that helps us automate this process and we can run uh, all the assets that are our source of providers. Uh, so that way we have a way to benchmark all the work easily and also be able to give feedback uh, to our providers in a more standardized way. Awesome. Um, and part, I mean, I'm still like thinking what is the actual services, the, the most services you guys work internally, like an example of, yeah, we localize the game or we port the game to, for, from PlayStation to PC. What, what is the usual, like the biggest services you guys uh, develop uh, on, on I think it's great for Rob to, and then Dave to chime in. Yeah, the answer is everything. So engineering, art, design, audio, localization, user research, uh, uh, user experience. Um, we even have groups that help us with things like rating the game and making sure that it meets quality standards and, uh, and will fit on disc. So we're looking for a little bit of everything. Um, but the thing that we're most interested in these days is co-development. The idea that we can take a team and augment it and make it three to five times larger by finding somebody who has a relevant amount of experience and has all the disciplines that I just mentioned and can extend our teams into the size that we need in order to deliver a game with the amount of content that you're used to playing. <clears throat> Pardon me, just to add to that. I mean, we outsourcing we've done it. sorry closer um, so traditionally it's art and animation work has been the bulk of what we've done and what we're looking for is uh, assets for the games it's probably our biggest area we've ever done but 
to Rob's point, that's now growing into, and becoming much more diverse. We're looking also even to extend it to as far as co-development, doing design, doing extra work in some of our games. Um, but, we're, but we're really picky with who we work with. They've really got to show that they, they're passionate about the work, about the quality that they want to drive, and, and just being able to turn around the work quickly with as few iterations as possible. Uh, but that's been the traditional path, but it's definitely opening up wider now. Great, and obviously because the, the amount of data you guys are interchanging between studios, I can imagine technologically speaking is like a really struggle I can imagine because again like uh, all the studios are spread around the world. What that means in, in terms of security, in terms of data control, in terms of you know, leak information, like how, how hard is to maintain that, that, on, that under control? I mean, it's definitely a challenge, but the thing that we have found is like everybody's trying to do the right thing for the most part, right? Uh, we have certain standards that we, we expect our studios or, or partners to follow in terms of information security, in terms of the type of infrastructure they have, the level of support. Sometimes it's very difficult to work with a partner that doesn't have local support. Like we cannot be their IT support, as an example. So we have certain capabilities that we expect the studios to have. Um, but once you clear that line, once you clear the information security line, we go through the diligence, um, then we put these vendors or these partners on, on, as preferred partners, people that we can work with on a regular basis. Um, the, the issues with leaks and, and whatnot, they're not very common, they do happen. But again, for the most part, when we, when we have a partnership, everybody's trying to do the right thing. And as long as we follow the right policy, um, we minimize that, that risk. And, and I'd like to add, <clears throat> we, we, we have a, a similar, um, issue when we're dealing with Paola said with localization because normally the source content we make internally is always in English that is how usually what we develop then when it get, needs to get translated and re-recorded in Spanish or in German or something like that we use external companies to do that um, and they need access as well to our internal uh, localization system that we have it's a database system that is accessible externally um, you know from a web interface and internally, for, by the developer, directly from like in-game in editing tools and, and things like that. So that we have a big similar problem to solve that, to keep the data safe, especially when really using a lot of external other companies to do various parts of the, uh, the AAA localization pipeline. We have an, a whole dedicated team that actually uh, we work closely with from an audio technology standpoint of view, because it's actually the... The, the type of asset in game that is the largest amount of assets. If you look on disk, most of the audio assets are all localized languages because there's so many of them and we have 50, 100,000 lines, these kinds of numbers, they're huge. Um, so that, that is definitely an area where we work a lot with external partners just to make it possible because it's a very back-end, we call it a back-end loaded process. You really can't localize the game until all the writing is done. So that means that the entire localization process for like 10 plus languages happens in a three month span at the end of the development cycle. So that, that usually means that we need a really good solid technology solutions but where the data is entered in a, a systemic way so that we can compress this entire process at the end by basically going very parallel uh, outsourcing to do all that work. Something to add, okay. Mm. Other uh, point that I, I'm interested is uh, PlayStation used to release all the titles on the console, but once they turn into a PC, I can imagine the challenge, technically speaking, and again, opening a new Pandora box in terms of production, how do you say, Carlo, that change uh, impact the, the, the studios internally? Well, for, for, for the technology side of, of, of things, my, my team works on all the internal audio tech uh, for PlayStation Studio. So anything we need to do to get audio in game, we have in-house solutions. I know there's external solutions like FMOD or WISE, but we have an internal uh, solution that's really targeting more the higher end. So that was for us a big challenge because we were always only working on PlayStation. So that means you can push everything to like 99.9% .9 to get everything out of it because you have a known set of hardware that you are targeting. So once we had to start supporting Switch, Xbox, you know, Xbox Series, PS4, PS5, mobile, 
Um, the biggest challenge is scalability. So coming up with a solution, a technological solution that is scalable and that ties in with content creation too. So this is a good thing to keep in mind, I think, um, for, for people that want to get into AAA game development is, is that assets need to be created with more thought in mind and more scalability because we're targeting such a, a disparate set of platforms that you know, maybe on PS5 we can play 100 variations of footsteps, but on Nintendo Switch we can only play four. And, and we need systems and content creation tools to be able to create that content efficiently. Because we can't go back and I'll do a whole pass for Switch and do a whole pass for Xbox. That is just too expensive to, to do. And I think it's really interesting because I think there's the technology, but if you, have, if you take a step back, it's a big cultural change, right? PlayStation has been successful for decades targeting our own hardware and, get, and squeezing all the performance out of the hardware, making the hardware shine. And then once you have different baselines for technology, you really have to change the way you think about it. And, and that has been a pretty big transformation. And, 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 and team, teams like Carlos' teams have, have really have to think it through and change the processes. It's not just about the technology, it's also about the mindset. And, and then we have that everywhere in the company. A lot of the tools that we built historically only work for PlayStation. Tools, localization tools only work for PlayStation. So adding a new platform is not just saying like, oh, well, let's, let's add a new button and a new switch. It's also telling the teams, now you have to think about it differently. How you create the content? How do you create the technology? How is your workflow? How do you ship on PC? Something we didn't know anything about, and now it's part of our, our common process. Um, also creating new capabilities. Like we didn't have to uh, worry about, well, we wanted the game to look really well on, on, on hardware for PC. There's a lot of different configurations there. Like once you have a fixed platform, it's much, much easier. So building new capabilities for how do you test on all those different configurations. So a, a lot of technology changes, but a lot of organizational and cultural changes at the same time. Dave? Yeah, I was just going to add, it's a great point. <clears throat> One of the things we had to systemically change was the QA system because we didn't have variations of PCs and all the different sound cards and all the different ways that worked. It was a lot of work to, to bridge that gap, and the team did it successfully, but it wasn't without pain. So we're still growing, we're still learning, we're still in that process, process of innovation on, on all the things that we're doing as we broaden the platforms we support. Talking about culture, how is the work culture in Sony? Like, again, like you're connecting uh, several countries. How you can align those elements with several teams? Well, the first thing I would like to add to, to that is because the same question came up yesterday at the Mixer event, is that <clears throat> I am based in Silicon Valley in California, <clears throat> and the average time that people stay at a company is approximately two years. At PlayStation, a lot of the people I work with have been there 10 years or longer. So to me, that's a, a, a really good indicator how nice of a company it is to work for. It, it's everybody is super passionate about what they do. Um, we, we've had events where, uh, uh, internal event we organize for all the disciplines, audio, uh, programming, you name it, where there's like 100, 120 people, that's just the audio people, you know, that are at PlayStation. And we've heard people say like, I've been to events for other teams and it's like 15 people are there for audio. So I think for, at least for, for my discipline, audio, Everybody is super passionate about it, like Dave's team and, and Paula. That's, I think, a, a big strength of our, our company. If I could add to that, um, when you ask about the culture at Sony PlayStation, and when I compare this to other places I've worked in my career, I think the answer is it's a very human approach. And that's human between ourselves. It's human with uh, people in our dev studios. And it's human with our partners. It's why we call them partners rather than vendors. The idea is that even though we're working in a very fast-moving, high-technology, frequently high-pressure environment to deliver on these immovable dates, these products that the audience is expecting, we still understand that at the end of the day we're human beings and we have to work together. And we're not all the smartest people in the room. We're going to have to hear other ideas and uh, be open-minded about how we approach and solve problems. Frequently we're solving them together. We were chatting about this earlier. Our job is 50% what our expertise is and 50% creative problem solving. And so when you think about your own individual career paths, your ability to creatively solve problems is as valuable as what you can do technologically. 
I, I would love for Paola to chime in for a couple of reasons. I mean, the, the first one, Latina. Second one, she works from Europe. So I, th I think her experience is super unique. So I'm, I'm curious how you describe PlayStation's culture. Definitely, yeah. Um, yeah, I wanted to chip in because for me, um, like working at PlayStation is a really, um, we're a team environment, basically. Like, uh, as Luis was mentioning, I'm, I'm Latina, you know, I, I work in the UK. Um, so, you know, you ha I had to get a little bit used to the UK accent. <laughs> the English accent is a little bit different. Um, and I'm the only woman in my, in my team. I'm part of the audio team. We're around, uh, around 30 people. Uh, in the UK creative arts team, and I've always been another team member. You know, I always felt like welcoming. Uh, whenever you come up with an idea, people are very open to listening to your idea, your contributions, and that's what makes the team so great and so enriching, right? Because um, we come from so many different backgrounds, and that's what makes working at PlayStation so interesting as well because we're always having like different ideas. And for me, it's been like a really like integral experience of being part of this like global team, you know? And like we have our friends in Malaysia, for example, and they share so, so many different things and, and they, part of their culture of their studio is like uh, integrating their own like um, roots from, from, from Malaysia as well. And, and you have the same, you know, in, in, in LA, um, in, in the UK, so all of that comes together quite well, I think, in, in our final products. I'll, I'll add one more thing. So I come from, I've been at Sony only for six months. I mean, we got acquired two years ago as Bungie, but I've been working on the, on the corporate side, or whatever you want to call it, for the last six months. Um, but I, coming from a studio, I always thought like, hey, the, the, the studio culture, you cannot replicate. It's driven by passion, small teams, that we know each other. Um, so I was, I was a little bit nervous moving to PlayStation. It's like, hey, how, how is the culture? And I was gladly surprised that that studio, small team culture, carried through. Like people took care of each other. They created the communities of practice. They were always communicating. They were always helping each other. So um, I realized that was one of the superpowers that PlayStation has. More than any other place I worked, I worked at or partnered with. So, so very, very interesting. The second, the second part about the culture is it is a truly global culture. We have a global workforce. We have folks from everywhere in the world. We have talent in many, many different countries. And that brings a different level of diversity in thinking, uh, cultural diversity, uh, innovation diversity, that's been super unique and, and, and very, very interesting. Like our team in Malaysia created new workflows um, that saved the company hours and many, many, many hours, many hours of iteration. Things that will, like you never thought, it's like, well, maybe that team is just churning content or whatnot. Like, no, we treat all the teams with respect. We allow them to we give them room for innovation, and we leverage the, the fact that we're a global organization. Awesome. And talking about uh, saving time, how you guys can uh, target redundancies? Like, you know, like being big, that means like that there could be processes that need to be improved. How how's the usual like month to month, year to year to make sure? the team is not doing something that needs to be optimized or something like that? Well, they will be perfect for that question. <laughs> so, you know, we're really fortunate because we touch all of the game titles. So we, when we solve a problem here, we, we bring it forward. So what we try and do is, and I think Paula has a, a great example of this, of some of the work she did on the breathing systems for one of the games, where it took them six, several months to set up, but for the next game, it took a week to implement. And so we're always trying to look at where are those pinch points that are just heavy lifting and, and for want of a better word, grind work, where we can improve that process. So we've been doing that across all of the teams. And that's one of the beauties of having a central team is they can share that knowledge across all of the, the, the different studios. Um, it's been great for us to, to see, you know, we work something on God of War that then translates to The Last of Us or it translates across these different projects that we work on. I wanted to add one thing, and this is a thing that I felt not only as uh, an audio professional uh, in the games industry, but overall the games industry as a whole, I think we're a great industry to work with because we're so open to sharing our experiences, what we know with others. We're not like uh, wanting to keep 
things to ourselves. Like we're really open and that's what makes our industry so great, I think. Uh, and in PlayStation in particular, um, we are so open to sharing our experiences. We're very lucky in the sense that we have so many studios that work with us that we can, you know, share, for example, Naughty Dog, how they do certain things, or Insomniac, how they approach a problem, for example, how they solved it. Uh, so all this knowledge sharing is so, so helpful as well to help us always improve, always make things more efficient. It's always where my, my, our mindset is, just because our games tend to be so big, you know? It's almost impossible, like the scale is getting bigger, bigger every time. So we always have to be thinking in the mindset of like, um, and not, not only getting a lot and all the information we get from the experiences of our teams and our, our projects, but also how can we make things faster and better and keep the quality standards that we have. It's always a challenge that we're dealing with constantly. Yeah, and just to add one last thing to that, <clears throat> you know, that also translates to the people we want to work with externally, our partners, because we want to help them elevate their game as well. We want to share with them our best practices and the way we work because your efficiency helps us. Also improves your ability to deliver content to us and solve our problems because sometimes we don't see the problems in our own faces and it's great to work with somebody outside and say, why are we not fixing this? So again, it's a two-way street. We're, we're always going to drive, but we also want people to like, hey, can you do this better? How can we, how can we help? Awesome. So changing... changing. A little bit of subject, because you guys, this is the first time being in Colombia, and you know, like in the States or UK, trying to find good profiles is quite easier. I mean, your PlayStation, probably a lot of people want to work with you. But being in a country like Colombia, the, the talent change in terms of experience or companies with a, enough uh, structure to deliver that triple A quality. What is the best advice for small studios that probably today they say, oh, so I can work with you guys. What is the, the path to, to reach that level or at least understanding what I need to do internally to one day work with you guys? So I'm very biased. I'm Colombian myself. I don't want to answer this question yet, but I want to let my colleagues, because uh, they have the, their first impression of, of Colombia. I'm curious what they think. Um, I can chip in in that as well. Um, I originally come from a background of uh, linear uh, audio design, so mostly film, uh, TV, that kind of thing. And then I changed to games. Uh, and it's quite different, uh, as you know. Uh, one of the things that I would say is the biggest, um, being Latin American and working abroad, uh, how the AAA games do things, um, you know, in, in the LA teams and the UK teams and stuff like that. I could say one thing that is very important is that we all have deadlines, we all deal with deadlines. Uh, in the video game industry, there are very tight deadlines, always. Um, so I think it's one of those shifts in mindset of like, first of all, when I came from post-production, it was like, I don't have as much time to do the things that I had before maybe, or as much, I don't have the same space, like uh, I, I need to be worried about, you know, like, efficiency in terms of space, in terms of uh, data, in terms of how I handle that kind of stuff. So always thinking about optimization, always thinking about doing things as quickly as possible with the quality that we need it. Uh, so thinking, okay, uh, you know, this took me a certain amount of time, but potentially I can, you know, just write a script in, in Reaper or something, and that can help me, you know, save this automated uh, process, automate this process so that I can just tag metadata in files and just do it automatically in a couple of seconds, what before would make me, maybe take me an hour or something. So always thinking about that of like, I need to hit the deadline, the deadline's not gonna change, but what can I change in my workflow to keep the quality standards that is being demanded from me, but do it in a way that saves me time, you know, and always uh, be able to deliver. I can add a bit to that as well. So. Obviously, as mentioned, our, our quality standards are excessively high, and it's important because we want our products to, to lead the market as much as possible. Um, our studios are always going to be looking for the top-tier talent. How do you present yourself as top-tier talent? The best advice that I can give you, because we look at partners all the time, each one of us, in our daily jobs, 
And what we're looking for is your best work. Uh, it doesn't need to be a lot of work. It just needs to be your best work. Anything that is not your best work, in your own estimation, only dilutes our impression of it. So don't be, don't be ashamed to only put forward you know, a, a small handful of assets or content, whatever it is you're, you're, you're hoping to partner with Sony on. Um, to add to that, your professional production practices, your ability to communicate clearly, to follow up, to deliver on your uh, commitments, to think ahead to the next thing that we may need is going to be really valuable because that's what we're doing internally already with our own tasks and not having to worry about our partners thinking about having to think through those things for our partners is really attractive to us. And the last thing I'll add is information security. <laughs> Nowadays, thanks to how easy it is uh, to in intercept information on the internet, um, being able to show that you have very high security standards in your studio, on your team, on your individual machines, how you take care of the information uh, and how you protect it on our behalf is going to get your foot in the door. You can have the greatest portfolio in existence. You can be the most professional studio in the world. Uh, if you aren't able to demonstrate that you can secure that information, it's going to be hard for us to, to find a way to work with you as much as we may want to. Um, because we have to protect uh, the value of the information of what we're creating. Um, leaks can, can destroy the momentum of a project, unfortunately. It's a sad world that we have to deal with that, but it is an important one. So I would say information security should be on your mind when you're thinking about presenting yourselves as a partner to Sony. And, and what I would like to add, just more as from an, <clears throat> from an individual standpoint of view, uh, it's my first time to Colombia. I'm originally from the Netherlands. Um, how the way I got into the industry myself, at that time in the Netherlands, there was no game industry. So the biggest thing that I've seen, we visited a few game companies, and the, the biggest thing I noticed that's an important quality to have is you've got to be passionate about what you do. You have to just love what you do. That's how I got where I was. And you always question what, if what you did, if you can do it a little bit better. Right? Don't... don't don't be happy with your whatever it is you made. It could be technology, code, music, sound, uh, graphics. You know, always kind of go like, could I do it a little bit better? Because I think that's the key thing is to always push yourself to be better and better and better. And, and I think in that regard, we're all very similar, right? If we are passionate about what we do, we naturally want to do that. I remember many times at like 11 o'clock at night, I was still messing with stuff just because I've got so into it and I wanted to make it better. Um, so that, that's, that would be my biggest advice is just do, do what you like to do and keep pushing to get better and better and better. I think that's great advice. I think for us, for me personally, first time in Colombia, it's been great to meet some of the developers here and talk to the people that are making the games here. It's, it's been a really great experience and just to get a sense of the country and the city. Um, I'm really looking forward that hopefully we can all connect and start to make you know, those partnerships we talk about. I think the thing for us, I, I mentioned at the beginning, is we are always pushing for what's the best quality, but also people have said here problem solvers, people who are going to help us make better games. And we have so much work, there's no way we can do it all internally. We have to work with externals. It's super important for us. And we want to see you thrive as much as you're going to help us thrive. Yeah, I'll plus one to everything my colleagues said. I com completely agree. Um, I, have, I, I want to add, like, I think, my perspective both as an industry professional and as Colombian. But I get to do a little bit of live, live this experience as a Colombian. And I think the advice I will give folks, I'll split it into three different areas. And I think it applies to you as a student, as a professional, or as a studio. And that advice is confidence, collaboration, and capabilities. So confidence, let's, let's walk through that first. Um, growing up in Colombia, it was very easy to look at international talent and say, I cannot do that. That's too hard. People are too good elsewhere. But when we have that mindset, we start undercutting ourselves. We start closing doors that we never knocked on. Right? When, I, when I started in this, in this industry, I looked up to a lot of people. And then one day, I was on the same table with those people. And one day, those people were asking me for advice. 
But the only way to get to that table is if you believe in yourself. Again, it could be as an individual, as a student, it could be as, as a professional, it could be as, as, as a studio uh, owner or, or as a co-founder. Do not, like, if you don't believe in yourself, don't expect a big company to believe in you. That doesn't mean to become arrogant, that doesn't mean, like, twist reality, but if you don't believe in yourself, don't expect other people to do the same. And it's very easy for us as Colombians to be like, well, that's something that folks in other places do. It's not what we do. No, we have the capabilities, we're super creative, we can do it. We're very big problem solvers, but believe in yourself. So that's, that's the confidence part. The capability part, like there was a lot of great advice given here. There's, you can take, build a taxonomy of capabilities. Again, if you're a student, if you're a professional, or you own a studio. If you own a studio, level up your infosec. You need that capability. Level up your portfolio. You need that capability. Like create a pipeline where you can scale your talent up and down. That's a capability. There's been tons of talks given about what, what studios look for outsourcing. Really sit down, think about it, and say like, hey, which one of these do I have? Which one of these don't I have? If you're a student or a professional, if you're a student that wants to be an engineer, hey, C++, C Sharp, you know those are gonna be core things. Hey, learn how to work in an engine, that's gonna be a core, a core part. Industry professional, look at GDC, look at all the talks that are out there and say, okay, what part of these am I missing? How do I level up my skill set? And then collaboration, the industry is eager to help. Eager to help, knock on those doors. Maybe nine, nine will not open. But the one that will open will level you up. Like there's so many, like the, the industry is, is based on a bunch of people that are very passionate and we want to help each other. We don't look down on anybody, right? So we want to we say like, they've, like, like they mentioned or Carlo mentioned, we want to level you up. We want to have that partnership. Um, so don't, don't be afraid. A lot of times I, I heard, I had this conversation with many studios that are like, hey, present to Sony. And they're like, well, I don't want to present to Sony. It's too high stakes. And I was like, no, let's make it low stakes. Present and we'll give you feedback. If you present poorly, it doesn't mean you'll never work with us. Quite the opposite, we'll tell you, hey, fix this, all these things, focus on these other things, we're here to help. And is, is this just one of the many choices you have. Almost every publisher out there, every developer out there, every student out there is there to help. If you're an, a student or a professional, find a mentor. There's plenty of mentors in the Colombian ecosystem. Like, find somebody from one of the existing studios, get him up for coffee and, and ask him, like, hey, how do I become better at what I do? So I think, I think that's my advice. Again, it doesn't matter which level you're, you're, you're in. Confidence, collaboration, and capabilities. Okay, the last question is, uh, let's think that I have those three points ready to, how can I approach to Sony to be, hey, I'm ready to work with you. Is, is there any process or is just randomly approach? Ooh, Rob, how we do that? <laughs> Well, you made a really good point, Luis, about uh, meeting people at conferences, taking them out for a coffee, sending a, a random email, um, advertising yourself uh, on the internet. We are always looking, right? There's, um, there is a great interest in finding the next talent, especially emerging talent coming out of university, uh, fresh ideas, new art styles, ability to do what the emerging technology is, we are on the lookout for that. Uh, if you are somebody who's looking to work with Sony, look for me, look for any one of us, introduce yourselves, share a business card, share a website. We're actually going to want to set up a meeting if you have a portfolio that presents itself is aligned with something that we're actively working on or going to be working on in the near future. So perhaps you think about a game like, let's uh, say, God of War. And that is a, a style that you would like to work in. And I'm using art as an example, but it could be engineering, it could be localization. Think about what, what, makes, what makes Sony uh, excited and share that information with us. We are going to be paying attention and we would love to hear about it. Um, there is not a formal uh, mechanism right now. There's not a, we don't have a place on our, on our website or anything where you can say, uh, submit your website, like as if you were a, presenting a job application, um, but we are around and we, you know, we visit conferences and we are always on the lookout. Perhaps you know somebody who knows somebody who knows one of us. Perhaps you find us on LinkedIn and send a message. LinkedIn's actually a great way and to say, hey, uh, we have something that we think might be of interest to Sony. Believe me, we will, we will read it because we're always on the hunt for the, the next best thing. Yeah, no, um, I, I think you have to put yourself out there so we can find you. 
right? It's not going to be the other way around. Like we have teams that hire from a technological side, like engineers and stuff. They, they find their people because people put their own websites online where they built some sort of DSP engine for audio or something like that. And you can tell, again, they're very passionate about it. They put a project out there and we read the same websites that everybody reads, right? We, we're all looking at the same uh, information channels. So th that would be my big advice is, especially for an engineering position, you, you kind of, it, it's kind of like an art portfolio idea, but put something together out there that, that, you know, on GitHub or whatever that we can find, that we can see so that we can learn um, what, what you do, what your capabilities are, stuff like that, because we, we will look at those things. It's not the only way is you have to know us and talk to us. That There's many ways for us to find you or indirectly you to find us. Yeah, just to add to that, you know, one of the things is it's a rip. Oh, I'm sorry. It's a really small industry. It's, as big as it is, it's still a relatively small industry. And people who are doing great work get noticed. <clears throat> so think about the work you're doing and, and that work and how you're differentiating from everybody else that's out there. There's a lot of people doing amazing art and amazing animation, but what's the thing that you do that differentiates you from the crowd? And <clears throat> we, you know, as Rob said, we're always on the lookout for that talent, for that something different that's going to bring a different flavor to what we do. But we're also looking for people who can churn a lot of content, great quality content. So we're looking for people that your reputation will help, how you advertise yourself, how you approach us. We're all approachable. We all want to work with you. We want to find the best developers. So take advantage of it. Take advantage of today. So we are ready to take some questions from the crowd. So we have a microphone for them. Tenemos un micrófono para que puedan hacer preguntas. Okay, super. Gracias, Carlo. So, uh, first of all, thank you for being here. I have a really small question, but I... Well, first of all, in my experience, I've done four VR video games, but I'm really curious, what makes you choose a game done by an external studio like Ghost of Tsushima by Sucker Punch to be a PlayStation exclusive? What makes it exclusive? What do you mean? Why do we make games exclusive? Yeah. Um, because of the business model. Like, I think the answer, the answer is, really, is really simple. Like, there's this synergy between the platform and the content, right? People want to buy the, the platform for the type of content they probably provide. And the, the, the content becomes a gateway to the platform as well. So to maximize the business model, you, you need to do both, right? The same reason why Netflix doesn't release their movies everywhere else. Right? You, you want to make sure that you, you create that amazing, unique value proposition for the PlayStation player. Thank you. Hello. Um, OK. My question is, uh, I have seen a lot of uh, job offers on LinkedIn on internet that says uh, use Canada or use US or use Europe. How can someone from Colombia or Latin America access those job offers? Is there any chance from someone from Colombia apply to those jobs? Or because they're in Colombia, they don't have any chance to apply to those jobs? I'll take a shot at this. So <clears throat> you can thank COVID for the fact that now we are very, very open-minded to remote work. And the fact that we're here in Colombia today is um, exemplary of the fact that we're starting to open our minds to areas that we hadn't previously considered. So we are going to start listing jobs more broadly in the world. But even if you see a, something that is listed in the Americas, it is worth applying because what we're looking for, to sound a little bit like a broken record, is the talent and the ability and the expertise not necessarily where you live in the world. There's a huge advantage in Colombia, something that we discovered this week on our visit, is that you were very advantageously aligned with our time zones. You know, Sony Interactive is headquartered in California. It has major offices in Europe and Japan. Being in that arena allows us to deliver on our products more effectively. 
So we're definitely interested uh, in Colombia at this point, and I would encourage you to, uh, to apply when you see anything listed in the Americas. And, and to answer your question, to give a little bit of a real-world example from an engineering position, we, we have a, had a, a very, I can't say about the details, but an audio-related project that required quite specific knowledge. So it's very difficult to find engineers that have that knowledge. So in the end, as an example, we ended up hiring, it was for a job based in the UK in London, but the applicant that got the job actually lived in Israel as an engineer. He worked for Waves you know, in Tel Aviv. Uh, he just applied to the, to the job. Obviously, there's immigration and things like that that come into play, but to speak to what Rob said, that, that, that depends really on what the skill set is. This was such a difficult skill set to find that you know, the, the company, has, there's a lot more leeway to help with these kinds of things. So it, it depends a lot on the situation. I think that, oh, last question. Okay, thank you for here. Uh, currently I have a, a son, his name is Jean-Pierre, he is 13 years old. He decides to be game designer, no developer, no art design, game designer. What do you do advice for him uh, for this industry, for the path, what can be in the future for game designer in this industry? Um, I can probably chip in on this because, as, as I mentioned, I'm from Guatemala. Um, grew up there, you know, as, as many of you, I have a dream of working in, in, in entertainment, right? I wanted to work in audio. Um, and my parents look at me like, uh, what are you thinking? <laughs> you know, usually. And... Uh, Thankfully, um, there's a lot of opportunity, but the thing about opportunity sometimes is that you have to be actively looking for it, right? Uh, and you have to put yourself out there as well. So, you know, scholarships, things like that. There's so many programs right now for, for video games uh, that specialize sometimes in, in the uh, specializations that you want to, to work on. Um, so much content online that's free even. Um, all the game engines uh, on real, you know, you can download that, download games, you can start doing stuff yourself. So I think it's a lot of like, get your hands dirty, you know, and, and start doing your own stuff. Start showing people that what you can do, what makes you special, you know, like um, what you can bring to the table that no one else has that makes you, make people notice you. Um, but you have to put the work out there, you know, like sometimes, you know, sometimes there's a little bit of an element of luck, sometimes there's a little bit of an element of, you know, like you have good, uh, you've been to a networking event, someone remembers you, you know, like, um, you know, being good communication, at communicating with people, um, you know, but also, like, what's going to speak for you is just the work that you can do. And the fact that you, you deliver your work on time, you're professional, um, and you put really creative, really awesome stuff out there, and people will notice. Rob, and then I'll, go. I'll add to that, that <clears throat> excuse me, uh, we all contribute to making a game in our own way, but arguably the designer has one of the most important roles, right? That's the thing that you remember when you play a game is the experience. And so it, at the risk of oversimplifying it for your son, uh, there are three C's. They're different than Luis's three C's, and these is, this is camera, combat, and controls. And the, there you go, right? <laughs> the designer needs to think about those things, those things. How does the camera frame the experience? How do the controls allow you to interact? And what was the third one? Combat, right? The all important, whether it's puzzle solving or anything, we just call it combat, is what is the thing that you are doing? Another way to think of it is what is the compulsion loop? The thing that keeps making you move forward in the game. So my advice for anybody who's interested in game design is to think about what is going to make me want to do the next thing and how do I present that to you in a way that makes it easy enough to do that you want to keep doing it again and again. I completely agree with Paul and Rob. I'm going to add something else, a little bit a diff different angle to the problem. Um, if you're a game designer in Colombia, you go through uh, doing the work, you learn how to do the work, you take all these courses, think about the three C's, the six C's at this point, um, and, and you feel stuck, you're like, hey, what do I do next? Right? There's, um, there's amazing creative talent here. Like, reach out to them. They have 
Daniel from Terravision, you have Rocha for Incorporated Dreams, you have Julian from Effecto. Send them a note and be like, I'm stuck with this thing and I'm signing up a bunch of people to do work right now, but I think, I think you might get an answer. Like, there's amazing talent here. You don't have to go outside for advice. Like, start there and then once you level up with them, you can start opening your horizons to see like, well, I, I want to look at how people do camera for specific titles and ask somebody there. But do not like, undersell the talent we already have here that has gone through that journey themselves. So after you go through the basics, like latch on to the, to the local community. Okay, guys, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we're running out of time. So thank you for being here and thank you to everyone. Woo.